Hey everybody, today Rado runs through his game collection. Oh boy, don't ask me why I'm doing this. A uh, bunch of people have asked me, I'm, I'm surprised a large amount of people have asked me, hey, you, we see your big wall of games, could you please run through that wall? And I'm like, ah, ah. Uh, there's a lot of stuff. There's over 300 games up there, but people keep asking, and I've always just kind of put it off. But then I saw the other day Joel Eddy of Drive Through Review did a run through of his, and I'm like, okay, well if Joel can do it, I guess I can do it. <sighs> okay, so here we go. I guess we'll just start over there, down in the bottom left corner. I have no idea really how to go about this, but well, actually, well, first of all, not on the shelf. These are a bunch of expansions uh, that basically I have not put their stuff into the main boxes yet. I need to get around that. Some of these I haven't even opened, but yeah, basically I don't have room for any expansion boxes anywhere on this wall, so I just need to get these. And also there's a couple of prototypes in here I haven't gotten to yet, hoping to run through them before too long. But okay, here we are down in the bottom left corner. I guess we'll just start at the bottom so I can sit down. Right, what do we got? Antiquity. Uh, incredible, big, complex game, although probably most notable, you can't quite see how far back it goes there, the box itself is ridiculously huge for no good reason. It's just a bunch of terrain tiles and about a billion and a half chits. I've done a run through for it. It's a very, very cool game, very fiddly, lots of um, pieces you have to manipulate, but it, it for the trade-off of being so fiddly, you get a really interesting civilization building game that has a almost obsessive uh, amount of gameplay mechanisms revolving around pollution, which is really cool. Makes it very, very interesting. Okay, so on to the next. Uh, to Call and To Call 2. To Call, Jen and I actually like quite a bit. Although, as a two-player game, there's a specific variant you pretty much have to use. It's on Board Game Geek. Uh, if I ever do a run-through of To Call, I'll definitely show how that variant works because out of the box, it's not a particularly good two-player game. But with that variant, it becomes an excellent two-player game where players are using action points in the jungle to explore and find ruins and do area control. Really, really cool game. To Call 2, the sequel, that only came out a few years ago. Radically different game. It's kind of cool though, it's basically like in Tikal, you have this whole big jungle and you find lots of ruins all over the place and you're just trying to put your researchers down to lay claim on the different, you know, the archaeological rights of them. Tikal, two basically takes the focus of that, of one, and makes it just, okay, now we're focusing on just one of those ruins and we actually explore inside the ruins. So it's almost like a cool one-two that these two games, so they're both very neat. Uh, Railways of the World, there's actually quite a few expansion maps in there as well, you can see the box has expanded quite a bit, it doesn't fit all the basic stuff, but an absolutely amazing game. Our favorite train game, uh, works great to players if you have the right map. Um, out of the box, uh, Railways of the World, the, it comes with a US map and Mexico map. The Mexico map is kind of an okay little introductory thing, but we have the Europe map, which is excellent. Absolutely wonderful. We don't play that game enough. Huge, big, gigantic board. Very, um, very meaty, very thinky, but also incredibly simple. One of the shortest instruction manuals I've got of any game in that gigantic, heavy railways of the world. Okay, Los Incognitos. I've actually done a run through of that a little while ago. Very cute, cool dice rolling and drawing with uh, markers, um, you know, erasable markers on the board game. Uh, very, very neat, very clever, kind of all alternative to the standard Yahtzee style dice stuff. Town Center, I've done actually, oddly, I think I've done more run through videos for Town Center than any other game and I might be doing another one in the future. But it's a very, very neat abstract city building game. Uh, actually, I like it quite a bit as a solo. I might actually play it this afternoon since Jen's out. Who knows? <clears throat> okay, Battle for Souls. This just showed up in the mail a couple days ago. I'll be doing a run through for it before too long. Seems like a fairly neat battle between heaven and hell kind of thing. Uh, most notable for its uh, incredible artwork. It's using all classic artwork that's sourced. Um, but the interesting thing is actually a lot of people have a problem with it because there's a lot of nudity and a lot of really gross, horrific looking art that people have done over the years to represent the battle between heaven and hell. So anyway, that's Battle for Souls. Spellbound, I've done a run through for it. Big, gigantic box full of big, gigantic pieces. The pieces are like this big, uh, really cool sculptures. Uh, a fairly neat kind of lightweight 
cooperative game that Jen and I enjoy, but really we mostly enjoy it for its table presence. Fallen City of Carez by Golden Egg Games. Have not gotten this out yet. It has a gorgeous board. Really excited about it. Really kind of like the idea that you're helping rebuild a city, but you're also running dungeons. And you know, as I equip my dungeon, my opponent can go into my dungeon. And, and so I'm not really quite sure what it's all about, but I know it has a gorgeous board. I like the idea of it. A lot of people complain that the manual for it is awful, just absolutely terrible. I don't know if that's really the case or not, but we'll be getting to it before too terribly long, hopefully. Although actually, I know the designer is actually working on co-op rules for it now, so I'm almost inclined to wait to see how the co-op game comes out, so that'll be really interesting. Okay, moving on to the next. I'll, I'll probably just go back and forth and then go up to the next level. Or no, actually, I have no idea how long it's going to take. This is five minutes just to get that one little section. That's 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50, 55, 60, 65, 70, 80, 85, 90, 95, 100, 110. Wow, okay, so this is gonna be a long video. Maybe I'll just do it um, in several pieces. I'll just do this shelf. So let's move up. Alrighty, just make it up as I go. Alrighty, here we go. As I should say, by the way, uh, for the most part, these are not really organized with any particular rhyme or reason. Mostly, more than anything else, it's box size. So these are a bunch of odd size boxes, and Stronghold has a really strange size box they like to use. But anyway, so. Amerigo from Stefan Feld. This is actually getting, uh, you know, this is a real Marmite game this year for Feld. Uh, people seem to love it or hate it. Jen, I love it. Actually, at this point, it's our favorite Feld of the year because we think that the cube tower works great. A lot of people say it doesn't work well, but it works well for us. We really enjoy it a lot. Venetia, one of the games I picked up at Essen this year, haven't played it, hardly know anything about it. I just know people really want me to cover it, so I will be getting to it. Uh, Navigador, have done a run through for it. Great, great game for Matt Gertz. Is Rondell system really wonderful sense of expanding your personal world as you open up these trade routes to you know from uh, from is it Portugal to the Far East? Great game, wonderful. We really enjoy it. Pathfinder, one of our surprise favorite games of the year. Didn't really expect we were going to like this very much. It seemed like a really shallow. Um, just almost kind of brainless card game, and you know, to a certain extent, it is. What I said in the run through, this represents a uh, gameplay experience. This is a card game version of Diablo, the computer game. In, it, in that game, you just click, 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 get loot, 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 loot. That's what you do in this game. And what makes it so compulsive is the loot you collect, you um, you keep between missions. So your character levels up like a traditional pen and paper RPG. So we really enjoy that. Going, going, gone. Uh, this is from Scott Nicholson, the famous board game blogger who kind of got all of us started on, you know, me and Tom Vassell and Joel Eddy and, and uh, everybody who does, we all all oh, a big thanks to Scott Nicholson, and he's put out his second game this year, a very, very cool party game. Uh, we have played it once. We thought it was very, very cool and fun and clever. I don't know if it really has legs as a two-player game. If we had parties a lot, I definitely would recommend it highly. Space Sheep, really excited about this. Haven't tried it yet. Real-time co-op game. Very, very cool. Can't wait to give it a go. Steam Park, uh, I, I not really know much about it. It's a game where you are building a theme park with kind of a steampunk flair. I know it has really, really far out art. Looks really nice, and uh, and apparently the 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 por portion of the steam park you make are actually a little standy. So you actually see a 3D park that you build, which um, which is probably the thing that enticed me the most. Endeavor. This is a great game. I think it's actually really, really hard for people to get now. It's been out of print for a while, unfortunately. But oh wow, this is a really, really gorgeous, gorgeous game. And it's really thought-provoking, too, um, because one of the big components of the game, this is another one of the you know, global native exploration and colonization, expand your colonies, uh, take over the world kind of game, but this game actually models the effects of slavery. Players can go into, I mean, for lack of a better term, they can, be, they can go into the slave trade, and, um, you know, and it really does help give them a leg up during gameplay. But what can happen is, halfway through the game, there can be a game event that basically suddenly abolishes slavery. And then suddenly every player who had gone into it to basically to you know build their economic engine and get ahead suddenly finds themselves on the wrong end of history. It's actually really, really cool. I respect the hell out of this game that they don't whitewash it, that they actually um, you know try to you know present it in its in its 
you know, it, it's historical context for why it happens. I mean, obviously everybody knows slavery is terrible and awful and, you know, it destroyed so many lives. But I, I, I respect the game that actually tries to show, not necessarily the other side, it doesn't try to make out that slavery is good, but it kind of shows the thought process of one of the reasons slavery could have happened. I think it's amazing, this game, that it's brave enough to tackle that subject matter and um, while well, still just actually making a really cool, compelling game. Uh, Endeavor, absolutely amazing. Uh, and yet, people don't seem to know about it, and it's almost impossible to find now. Okay, Trollhalla, very, very fun game of trolls. Uh, giant Viking trolls sacking villages and taking booty and all that. Just a lot of fun. This would be a really great family game, but Jen and I enjoy it too, just uh, for the two of us. Okay, moving up, standing up. Let's see here. Oh, uh, this is... The Great Zimbabwe, I've done a run through for it. Very, very heavy economic goods transportation game with a lot of really interesting um, mechanisms all about route building as you try to move goods from one place to another. Normally we hate pick up and deliver stuff. I wouldn't say that's what this is, but it's a really cool, interesting game with a really great look too. Dixit, this is the only game you will see anywhere on our shelves that requires at least three players. Every other game we own plays well with two, or or, or, or we're trying to get rid of it because it doesn't. This is the only one we own, and really we own it because Jen loves it, and every time somebody comes to our house who doesn't know board games, they're gonna end up playing this before they leave uh, as kind of like the ultimate gateway. And we just never get to play it by ourselves, so Jen always wants to play this whenever she can. High Frontier, oh, I'm very, very sorry. I've been meaning to do a run through for this forever, but my God, this has the worst manual in board game history. History. This manual is so incredibly hard to get through. Every time I try, I just fail. I did actually the other day find some really good rules that I'm actually starting to allow me to grok the game so I can do a run through hopefully before too long. Hopefully before the end of the year. Alrighty, a bunch of little games that fit in this little space. Gunrunners from um, Dr. Finn Games. Uh, he's also done Biblios, which is one of our actually probably our number one favorite filler game. And so Gunrunners is his latest. Uh, players are international agents trying to stop gunrunners. Looks very cool, haven't played yet. Boss Monster, this was a Kickstarter game. Actually turned out to be really cool. I was really kind of nervous about it. I just took a punt because of the subject matter because of course I'm old enough to have played all these classic uh, games growing up. And um, you know, actually I got my job in the video game industry working for Nintendo in the NES era. And so was really excited about this. Turned out it was a really good game, We're really surprised. Uh, as players are the boss monsters trying to build their dungeons that heroes will come into. Fleet, I've done a couple of run-throughs for this for its base game and the expansion. Great, great game of Arctic fishing and high, tense, tense auctions. Absolutely fantastic. Fjords, this is another game that's going to be hard for people to find. Wonderful little game. We often take this one when we go on trips because, I mean, I don't need the whole box. It's just, you know, it's just a bunch of tiles and cubes inside, so I can just throw it in the bag and leave the box at home. And it's a great, great game. Jen, lo Jen and I love playing it at restaurants and whatnot. Absolutely wonderful. In fact, I have two copies of the game in here so that I can play, we can play Mega Fjords, the popular variant amongst those who have been lucky enough to get two copies of this out of print game. Blueprints, I did a run through for this at Essen this year. Neat little dice game where you are rolling your dice and then stacking them to build skyscrapers. Clever, fun, nice filler. Shadowrift, done a run through for this. Great, great cooperative uh, deck building game. I think the first one, uh, you know, Marvel Legendary gets a lot of credit for, oh wow, carpenter, but this was beat, Mar um, and actually, I still think this one is better than Marvel Legendary. We got rid of Marvel Legendary, we kept this. Great, great fantasy game, because the cooperation in here is real, it's meaningful. Unlike Marvel Legendary, where everybody's kind of, for the most part, playing their own game. Here, you really do work together. SOS Titanic, I think this is gonna be one of our absolute favorite games of the year. It's Klondike. Like, um, with a Euro trapping, special character roles, a really strong integrated theme, but you know, still the raw core uh, mechanisms of Klondike or Patience or Solitaire, as it's also called. Wonderful game, can't praise this enough. Linwood, haven't played it yet. It's from a, uh, a publisher designer in New Zealand, I've been meaning to for quite a while. Battleline, uh, Jen loves this game. I hate it because she so utterly and completely destroys me at it, but it's a very, very cool two player card game where there is literally a battle line and you're kind of uh, you know playing cards to your side. Great, great game, very uh, classic. One of Kenichi's best, I believe. And um, don't tell Jen I've got it. Actually, I traded it away because she always destroyed me so much, it just made me sad. And then she one day said, hey, I want to be battle line. And so I had to go get another copy. And so you can see it's still in shrink wrap because she hasn't asked to play it yet. Don't tell her I've got it. 
because I don't want to feel stupid because this game makes me feel dumb when she just absolutely destroys me. Oh, standing up now. Okay, continuing on. Legacy Gears of Time, done a run through for this. Great, great, this game truly captures the feeling of time travel. And um, a wonderful, wonderful temporal area control game, um, you know, with cause and effect, you know, causality loops, everything you would want. Great fun, it's predominantly a card game, can't recommend it enough. Agents of Smirsh. This is a neat co-op game. It's got one of those ones like uh, Tales of Arabian Nights where it's got a big, gigantic, oh, what do you call it, um, phone book full of little paragraph-long snippets of story. And as you're running around the world trying to save it from the evil machinations of Dr. Lobo, a kind of a James Bond villain, you, uh, you figure, oh, well, I've landed over here. That means we have to open the bo book to page here, you know, read a little bit of story, make a decision, roll some dice. Very simple, very light game, but really enjoyable. Um, we like it more than Tales of Arabian Nights because there was some game to it, whereas Tales of Arabian Nights is really, at the end of the day, just a interactive choose-your-own-adventure book, um, whereas this one has a little bit of gameplay. Mm, okay. Dice Town. Jen loves this game. I, I, I don't think it's really worth playing two players at all. Though you can play two player, but with more players, you know, three or four or five or six with the expansion, it's a lot of fun. Really, really cool dice rolling game where everybody's rolling dice that have card, um, you know, uh, you know, kings, queens, jacks and, on them, uh, you know, and, and trying to score poker hands in an old west setting. Absolutely wonderful. Really, really fun party game. Um, uh, Freedom and Freeze Copycat and uh, Power Grid First Sparks. These are my two Freedom... I've, we've tried almost every Freedom and Freeze game out there, gotten rid of most of them. These are the two that we've kept because we actually enjoy them. This is a very simple, very streamlined deck builder. It's even, I mean, um, it, it, you know, it's a deck builder as a gateway. This is even simpler than straight up Dominion, vanilla Dominion. But, um, you know, the, the theme is, is kind of cute. It's, it's all about, you know, political race and, you know, trying to build up a political uh, campaign and, and um, you know, win, you know, whatever seat you're trying to win. Uh, Jen likes it a lot. I think it's okay. Fun game. Copycat. Power Grid First Sparks. We've tried Power Grid, and it's a terrible, it should not be labeled as a two-player game. But Power Grid First Sparks is actually really, really nice. It takes some of the elements of Power Grid and sets it in the era of cavemen, um, you know, trying to build up their society rather than, you know, modern-day power conglomerates trying to power the East Coast of the United States. Actually, this game gets a lot of grief from Power Grid fans saying, it's crap, this is nothing like Power Grid. But to us, that's a good thing. I mean, it's, it's uh, taken on its own. I think it's actually a really sweet, fun little game. Not the greatest game in the world, but a nice one. And, um, you know, don't have the Power Grid fanatics, you know, don't let their bias, oh, don't hold against the game because on its own merits, it's actually a very, very cool game, even if it's not Power Grid. It's not supposed to be. Okay, uh, Merchant in the Middle Ages. Actually, a lot of the games I've got um, I end up getting in math trades. I'm never really sure if we're going to like them or not. This is one. We haven't played it yet because supposedly it doesn't really play very well with two players. But I picked it up because, you know, I was in a math trade. It looked like it was, it looked like it was worth giving a try, and the game I was trying to get rid of we didn't want. So sooner or later we'll give it a try. I don't really know much about it. It's, a, uh, it's another route building pickup, you know, deliver stuff from one place to another. Jen, I normally have very little patience for pickup and deliver. Plus, supposedly it doesn't work very well with two, but we'll see. Eventually I'll get around to it. Ah. Star Trek Expedition or Baby. You know, this gets a lot of grief, but we think this is fantastic. If I ever get around to doing a top 10 countdown of cooperative games, this will definitely be on it because it is a wonderful, wonderful game. And, you know, and it is probably the closest thing you can um, align it to is Pandemic. It has a lot of the same kind of feel, the flow of Pandemic, but with Star Trek, or I should say the new modern J.J. Uh, Abrams Star Trek characters running around trying to solve problems on an alien planet. I think the game gets a lot of grief because it has one storyline, and every time you play, you basically go through the same storyline of this particular planet that's having political problems and power problems and invading Klingon problems, and you'll say, oh, I never want to play it again I've already heard the story. And I say to them, what, so you only ever play Pandemic once because you've heard the story? The story doesn't matter. The gameplay in it is good and fun and solid and fast, and it feels like Trek. So we really like Star Trek Expeditions. Ah, Francis Drake. I'm going to be doing a run-through for this pretty soon. Officially, it is a three to five player game, but there has been a variant that um, a Board Game Geek user came up with that the designer has anointed as truly 
as, as making it officially a two-player game. Actually, I should say that's true for Endeavor as well. Endeavor is officially a um, three to five player game, but they ultimately released a variant online that turned into a two-player game. Jen, I think it plays fantastic. Pretty soon we'll be doing a run-through of the two the official two-player variant for Francis Drake. Again, definitely before the end of the year. Okay, Hobbit, Unexpected Journey. This is another one I picked up at Essen. Don't know anything about it. Really don't know if it's going to work particularly well, but people want to see a run-through for it, so I will be getting to it. Ah, oh, Cardboard and Sun. I've done a run-through for this. This was a really cool event that happened in Greece on the island of Paros. Uh, board game, uh, you know, holiday travel event, which, coming back, we ended up getting a box that kind of commemorated the event. There's a little game in here called Thermopolis. It's a very, very fun, small card game, but, uh, you know, this also has kind of some mementos of, of the uh, trip we did, so that's why we leave it on the shelf. Okay, um, ah, Artipia, Archon, Drumroll, and Among the Stars. Okay, Among the Stars, fantastic game. It's a card drafting game, kind of like Seven Wonders, except uh, you're drafting cards, yeah, I've got a handful of cards, I have to take one and give the rest to my neighbor, and you use those cards to build a space station in front of you, a really far out futuristic alien space station with all kinds of cool special powers and whatnot. Awesome game, we absolutely love this one, uh, Artipia Games, Among the Stars. Drum roll, um, let's see, this one, I've only played it once, and I remember when we first played it, we thought, hey, that was pretty cool, but we weren't really sure we loved it, but so many people have demanded a run-through that I've gotten another copy and we're going to be giving it a few more tries. Actually, one of the things I've been told is that um, maybe one of the reasons we didn't enjoy it the first time we played it is because we played it straight out of the box. Apparently, there have been a couple of mini expansions, and we do have those now, that really open the end game up and make it a lot more interesting. So, I'm looking forward to trying it again and seeing if our original concerns were quelled. But, you know, we certainly love it. It's a gorgeous looking game. It was very, very solid, very, very tight. Can't wait to try it with those little mini expansions that supposedly fix our issues. Archon, I did a run-through for just this the other day. Very, very cool worker placement game. Um, I think in the video I said it might might be the most innovative worker placement game of the year of 2013. Big words, because there's a, several other really cool worker placement games too. Really, really neat. Gorgeous art, gigantic board, lot to love. Um, we have kind of mixed feelings about it as a two-player game though, and you, you could read my final thoughts to know more about it, but still, great game. If we had three or four-player games, I think this would get a lot of table time, because it's just a really rock-solid worker placement game. Homesteaders. Ah, this is a heavy, well not a heavy, kind of a medium-weight auction game set in the Old West that has a, re it's one of those ones that has a really great sense of escalation. As you start off doing little things, by the end of the game, you're doing big, gigantic things. Really, really rock solid game. Re definitely need to do a run through of it someday. Gnomes of Zavendor. I think this made uh, my top 10 fantasy games, even though hardly anybody's ever heard of it. This is an economic simulation of a bunch of gnomes working in gem mines, mining gems, but then also buying and selling them on a commodities table. So it takes a really great, it's a very, very rock solid commodities game, and then all also, with the fancy setting of gnomes and whatnot, really, really great. You like it a lot. You can find this really cheap everywhere because it just never caught fire, even though we think it's fantastic. Citrus. Okay, oh, another uh, game from Jeffrey Allers, a designer we really, really enjoy. We love uh, Lee Octa S. It'll be somewhere later on in the shelf. I don't know much about it. It's apparently about, you know, um, uh, citrus groves, that you're running a citrus grove, and you know, when do you harvest, when do you expand, all that kind of stuff. It's gotten a lot of really good buzz, haven't played it yet. Manhattan Project. This is a game we would never have played if it wasn't for you guys. Because, you know, I kind of dismissed it out of hand because I knew Jen would not care for the subject matter of building atomic bombs. Plus, originally I thought this game was way too aggressive because it has a lot of real, it's a worker placement game with a lot of, oh, I can place workers over here, which will destroy all of your stuff. And we knew we wouldn't like that. But it turns out, the, you know, the military stuff is very, very minor. You can ignore it and not really feel like you're missing out on the quality of the game. And then, turns out Jen did not like the subject matter, but the game itself was so solid, we ended up keeping it. We liked it a lot. Core Worlds. People have been asking me to do a run-through for this for quite a while. I picked up a copy at Essen this year. Can't wait to do it, although it might have to wait until early next year, because I'm so far behind. City Council. Very, very neat game. Uh, it was just finished on Kickstarter. This is my Kickstarter copy. I haven't taken it out of the shrink yet. Only played the prototype up to now. But Jen, I really liked it a lot. A SimCity style um, game where players have to work together because we're members of a city council. And if I want to get a particular building built in the city, I need Jen's votes. But then what will I have to give her in return so that um, you know that she will vote for my thing and not try to you know, block it in committee? Really cool, clever game. Lewis and Clark, I think this is for a lot of people going to be the game of the year. If they can get it, because it's very, very hard to get. It's 
completely sold out, hard to get anywhere, but an amazing game. Takes the card stuff of, of uh, Race for the Galaxy, mixes it with a really cool, um, with, with, you know, with some really cool worker placement stuff as well, like placing workers and then losing them. You don't get your workers back once you place them. Really, really clever stuff. I've done a run through for it. Absolutely amazing game. Um, let's see. Uh, Sarika, this is, I think, um, one of the only, I, th I think this game, is it on Game Crafters? Or did I order it directly from the, it's it's a little independently published game, you know, and, and just like, you know, a uh, uh, low quality box. But I haven't played it yet, but it's it looks like a very, very gorgeous, um, well, what do you call it? Uh, deck builder, uh, you know, about, um, you know, uh, the Silk Road between China and Rome or something like that. I actually got it quite a while ago. I haven't played it yet. Really, really want to. Re just absolutely gorgeous looking game. The, uh, the, the board is made out of wood. Uh, and I really just want to support this independent developer who has actually made quite a few very cool looking gorgeous games. So looking forward to uh, Serica Plains of Dust. And Paperclip Railway from uh, Tony Boyden, um, the designer of Snowdonia, which was one of our absolute favorite games of last year. This is an amazing game, too, where you are building rail lines between different stations out of paperclips. Out of, and it's, it's, just, it's a really full, cool, fun, tactile thing, snapping all these paperclips together, trying to maneuver them because, you know, they're all kind of snaky and wavy and trying to get them around the corner and whatnot. Very cool game. Uh, really underrated gem. Paperclip Rebels. And coming up to the top, we've got Claustrophobia. I just did a run through for this the other day. This is our go-to two-player kind of Ameritrashy me versus Jen dungeon crawl. The reason we enjoy it so much is because it has a lot of really, really cool and clever um, dice gameplay mechanisms that makes it feel more like a Euro and less like an Ameritrash game. Very, very cool. Claustrophobia. And it's gorgeous. Comes with painted minis. Love it a lot. Nations. This is easily one of the best games of the year for 2013 as far as, I mean, it's way too early to say, but right now it's definitely still in the running for best game of the year as far as I'm concerned. Although I've still got a lot of games to play as you'll see as I continue to run through this shelf. But absolutely amazing captures all the breadth and majesty of Through the Ages, but in half the time with half the complexity, absolutely amazing game. Just jaw-droppingly good. Jen, I cannot rave about this enough. A couple of little ones. Uh, Glastonbury, another game I picked up at Essen. Haven't played it yet. Looks like a very, very cool game about being wizards going shopping for components and kind of a ring around the rosy kind of thing. Looks neat. Litnisco, which is about running holiday resorts in um, you know pre-World War II Poland. Don't really know much about it, but it seemed very, very cool. And I picked up a copy at Essen. And then at a Atacama, which I know nothing about. The only reason I picked this up is because at Essen, um, on the second day, it had made it to like the top three most talked about games on one of the charts that tracks, uh, you know, buzz at Essen. And it was so super cheap, I just, whoa, gosh, people are talking about it? I don't even know what it is. I just bought it sight unseen. I hope it plays two players. Surely it must. Um, but I, I know nothing about this game. Apparently you put pyramids on stuff. Yep. Two order four. Have to get this out eventually, but I, this is this is a literally spur of the moment kind of like standing in line at the grocery store and you got the, all that stuff there at the end. I just picked it up for that. Hopefully it's cool. And let's see. And then here's our Stone Age cup full of rubber bands and um, the. Well, anyway, so. Let's see, I think I'll stop there because that was 27 minutes just to go through this one shelf. And so I will now do subsequent ones for this shelf, that shelf, that shelf, and then all the stuff along top. So this, I guess, was part one of one, two, three, four, five of Rotto Runs Through Shelf. Now, if you'd like to watch. And I was about to do film, just back to back parts two, three, four, and five. But you know what? Uh, something has come up. I don't think I'm going to be able to do that today. So I'm just going to go throw up this part one on YouTube today and let you guys feedback. Let me know if you even want to see parts two, three, four, five, or if this is just a bunch of silly, self aggrandizing board game shelf porn, because that's kind of what it feels like to me. It's quite silly. But if you guys like it, let me know. And I don't know, maybe I'll do uh, one section of this thing a week leading up to Christmas. Christmas or I don't know what. But anyway, I'm going to stop right there and parts two, three, four, and five may be coming in the future. And if they ever do, I will retroactively put a button on screen so you could go to part two. And so there may not be a button there at the moment, but it may be eventually there will be a button right around here, which you can click in five, four, three, two, one.